Grace and peace to you, friends. My name is Dean Weaver. I'm the lead pastor of Memorial Park Church, an evangelical Presbyterian church in the North Hills of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's a delight to welcome you to our program, Living Out the Word. Living Out the Word is an opportunity for you to join us as we worship Jesus, the Living Word, on a regular Sunday morning service of worship. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's our hope that this will help you to go deeper in your relationship with the Savior. If you do not yet know Christ, or you're not sure about whether or not you're a follower of His, we hope that you'll tune in and stay tuned in as we go together deeper in this relationship with the one who created us, loves us, died for us, and reigns in power for us and makes a whole new life possible. It's our mission at Memorial Park Church to invite people into a life-changing and ever-growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we hope this opportunity of worship helps you to do just that. So come join us, whether it's here in the sanctuary at the corner of Duncan and Peebles in the North Hills of Pittsburgh, or if it's on this station, we're delighted to take you now right to the throne of worship with Jesus, the living word.
Listen to Isaiah chapter 28, starting at verse 16. So this is what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with fear and panic. Praise be to God. Let's worship Him together. today, for you are our glorious and great Father, the only one worthy of praise, for you are eternal, you are immortal, you are invisible, but you are omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Thank you, God. We are keenly aware, however, of our sinfulness, Lord. We as a people, as individuals, as your church, as a nation, as a world, have often turned from you and your commands. Just as the people of Jeremiah's day, whose beautiful city of Jerusalem was destroyed and those people carried off into exile, we often see things in our world that crumble around us, sometimes feeling exiled, and we lament just as did Jeremiah. We too wish things were different. The people were always safe, that no one was ever hungry or homeless, that pain and suffering and war and tribulation did not exist. As we study your word, we feel the pain of the generations before us, just as we do today. We know you are thus drawing us closer to you, Lord. Lead us to turn to you in the midst of sorrow, suffering, and loss. Would you please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you all greet one another and uh, introduce yourself to someone you do not know? <laughs>
In June of 2009, um, I went to Mexico with Pastor Dean Weaver, our lead pastor here at the church, and with Don Creasy, who is our director of missions and outreach. And we went there to meet up with one of our ministry partners, a gentleman by the name of Paco Peñe, and the street children program that he was running called The Patio. Well, while we were visiting, um, one of my youngest daughter, Anna's best friends, a young woman here in the church, died tragically of a heroin overdose at the age of 17. And because of my relationship with that young woman, um, I was called on the phone to find out about it before it was ever announced here at home. And I have to tell you that I was overwhelmed with grief, just shocked and overwhelmed with grief. On top of it, I thought, how am I going to tell my daughter? She's going to be devastated. And here I am thousands of miles away, and I can't even imagine what it's going to be like to have to make that phone call and to let her know. I sobbed. I sobbed, and I, I cried out to the Lord, why? Why? I learned something on that trip about the holy nature of lament. Because you see, part of that trip was not only meeting with Paco, but it was also to go to the Lion of Judah Church in Mexico City and to meet with brothers and sisters in Christ. And boy, did they know how to lament. They knew how to grieve. They knew how to wail because, you see, when you are a poor person who lives every day of your life in the midst of loss and sorrow and suffering, you learn to grieve. You learn to lament. And they knew how to do that. Well, one day while we were at the church, I was sitting on a bench, and this, God bless him, this old man who was just riddled with arthritis, you could, it hurt me to watch him walk. And he approached me, and he got on his knees at my feet, and he began to weep. He began to weep because he was entering into my grief, helping me feel my pain so that I could be better. Shortly after he came, a group of elderly Mexican women came, and they gathered around me, and they began to lament too. They began crying out to the Lord in Spanish, and yet I tell you, I understood every word that they said because, you see, the language of lament crosses race, it crosses language, it crosses culture, it crosses everything. And these women then began to sit around me and lie down and kick their feet and scream and yell and cry out to the Lord. And you know what? They gave me permission to get rid of my inhibitions so that I could do the same. And so we all laid there, and we wept and we wailed. And in a while, there was a peace that came over me. Something had happened inside of me. And so that when I went home from that trip, I was actually available to help other people who were also grieving the loss of this young woman because I too had been helped. If you've been with us for the last four or five weeks, well then you know that we are studying the Book of Lamentation, which teaches us something about the sacred art of lamenting. We are in the midst of chapter four of five chapters. Five poems, this is a book of five poems of God's people crying out to the Lord. And they cried out to the Lord over the destruction of the city, Jerusalem, their holy city. They cried out to the Lord over the loss of their beloved temple and over the destruction of the people. Five poems of heart-wrenching grief where these people cried out to the Lord, how did this happen? How could this be? But if you've not been here over the last few weeks and you're wondering why it is that we are focusing on lamenting, well, two very practical reasons. First, we are in that season of Lent, that time between Ash Wednesday and the resurrection of our Lord on Easter, and that time is set aside for reflection, reflecting about our own lives and where we are in them. And reflecting about the state of the world in which we live in. So it's naturally a time to be solemn. And it may be a time for you to lament. And second, because lamenting is actually biblical. You know, today most people just get mad. They just get angry at the way things are when perhaps a more godly course of action 
would be for us to lament the way things are. Do you know that God cares enough about you and the things going on in your life? He cares about your losses. He cares about the things that disappoint you. In fact, he even cares enough for you for you to cry out to him when you think he's being unfair. Now, Michael Card, who is a musician and a biblical scholar, he wrote a beautiful book on lamenting called The Sacred Sorrow, and he writes this in his book. He says, people like Job, David, Jeremiah, and even Jesus reveal to us that prayers of complaint can still be prayers of faith. They represent that last refusal to let go of the God who may seem absent or worse, uncaring. It is a supreme honesty before a God whom my faith tells me that I can trust. And he encourages me to bring everything as an act of worship, including my disappointments, my frustrations, and even my hatred. So here we are. We are in this fourth poem, the fourth book of Lamentations, the fourth out of five, and there's still plenty of reason to lament here. Life has not gotten any better for the Israelites. There's more misery that they have to suffer. Now, by this time, the Israelites have been in the midst of suffering a two-year siege with the Babylonians camped right outside of their gate. Two years of not being able to leave the city. Two years of not having enough food as starvation sets in. Two years of the Babylonians waiting for them to be weak enough to conquer them easily. Well, the first 11 verses, so the first half of this poem, the prophet Jeremiah is reflecting on the devastation of the people, especially the children. Especially the children. Because you see, in a siege with the fields of food being outside the walls, and the people being stuck inside the walls, there's obviously a shortage of food, and here is what's happened. The parents are no longer sharing what little food they have with their children. And even worse than that, they're cooking their dead and their starving children as a way for them not to starve. And Jeremiah is lamenting this. In chapter 3, he says, even jackals who are the worst feed their babies. And ostriches, who are terrible parents, are far better parents than any mother found in Jerusalem today. This is what Jeremiah laments. And he goes on to say in verse 4 and 8, lamenting how things used to be, wishing they were that way once again. He says, you know, the children used to play in the streets. They used to go to camp. They used to sing. They used to laugh. And now all they do is they beg for food. The wealthy, well, they used to eat lavish meals, but now they eat whatever they can scrounge in the dirt. The royals used to be filled with splendor, and now they're famished and dirty and unrecognizable. And our anointed king has been captured, and he's been dragged away. You know, lament, prayer, grieving, all of these things are crucial as part of the Christian faith. And I would suggest that all of us here today have things that we would lament about, things that we wish were perhaps how they used to be. As I was writing this, I was thinking to myself, you know, when I was a kid, nobody locked their doors. Didn't even lock them at night. There was no reason to. And when I was a kid, we used to play outside until it was dark with no parents around, and I didn't ever once feel unsafe. I lament the fact that that is not the opportunity that I could offer my children when they were growing up. And I'm pretty sure that most of us probably lock our doors before we go to bed at night, if not sooner. Now, I know this is going to show my age, but I I also don't remember any of my friends growing up having divorced parents. And yet, the divorce rate today is so high that I would say probably at least a third of my kids growing up that their friends came from broken homes. It used to be that praying in school was a good thing. Now we can't do it anymore. It used to be that being a pastor or a religious leader, you were a valued and trusted member of the community. And today there are so many people who think we're just intolerant and hate-filled. 
You know, when I get on an airplane and somebody asks me what it is that I do, do you know I don't want to tell them sometimes? Because I don't, I don't want to be lumped into those people who are disrespected. And I lament that. I lament that that's the way it is. Do you have things that you lament? Things that you wish were the way they used to be? How about your marriages? Are they thriving, or do you wish to go back? How about your health? Is it as good today as it was once? How about your relationships? Do you have relationships where you just long to go back and do something differently? And what about your work? Is there lamenting somewhere in the midst of your work? I think we can all lament over things that we regret, things that we wish were the way they used to be. Now, before we hit these second set of verses that we find here in Lamentations 4, I want to bring us back to something from last week. Because you see, Lamentations 3 actually holds the big idea of the entire book. And I think there's something in here that we ought to be reminded of. Lamentations 3, we find this beautiful confession of faith that Jeremiah offers us. And he offers it in the midst of of the destruction. He offers it in the midst of his lamenting. It sounded to me like something in Lamentation 3 gave him some assurance, some hope, something stirred in him that maybe better times were coming. Beginning in verse 22, he writes this, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's where that wonderful hymn comes from. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, and therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Now, does that sound like a confession of faith or some sort of assurance to you? Because it sure does to me. But here's my question. Where did it go? Where did that faith go? Because when we get to Lamentation 4, all we have back is more misery, more suffering, more lamenting. There seems to be no hint that there was any faith that was offered at all. And so sometimes I have to wonder about that. Here's what I think it is. I think sometimes even in the midst of faith, we still need to cry out to the Lord, Where are you? I've had it. Enough is enough. I need help, and God feels very far away. I think that even in the midst of faith, we still need to cry out. There are times when it may very well feel like the faith that you have has gone underground and you can't find it anywhere. I think sometimes that the faith of Lamentations 3, we still have to walk through more suffering, recalling Lamentations 4, until we get to a point where we might be able to say something like this. I finally get it, Lord. You really are the last house on the block. You really are all that there is to hold on to. And so here's what I'm going to do, Lord. I'm going to throw myself into your arms, and I'm going to keep my eyes looking at you, and I am going to trust, and I'm going to have faith that you will get me through whatever it is that I'm going through. And, and, and my guess is, is that for those of you who are here today who have made that sort of statement, who have been through this, you know that God is faithful, don't you? He doesn't leave you, nor does he forsake you. Now, that does not mean that your situation is going to turn out the way you want it to turn out. But what it does mean is that in the midst of that, the relationship that you have developed with the Lord has grown closer Now let's turn to the second half of this poem, this lament, because in verses 12 through 16, Jeremiah, who's the author of this, he starts to ask the question, well, who's responsible for this? Who's responsible for the devastation that we are experiencing, for, for this Babylonian siege, for Jerusalem coming to destruction and the people starving? Whose fault is this? And actually, on first read, when I look at it, it seems to me like everybody's kind of at fault here. And the reason for it is that um, no one, not the king, not the prophets, not the priests, not the people, 
ever thought that God would allow his holy city to be destroyed. There was an arrogance in the Israelites that said, no matter how disobedient we are, God would never allow his temple to be destroyed. Oh boy, were they wrong. And in verse 13, we find out exactly why the destruction came. And it came because of the sin of her prophets and her priests. Now, I want to read a verse, read that same verse, verse 13, but I want to do it in the message, because sometimes when you hear a different translation, there's something else that you can catch. And here's what it says in the message, verse 13, because of the sins of her prophets and the evil of her priests, who exploited good and trusting people, robbing them of their lives. The guilty ones, the ones responsible for the sins of these good and trusting people, well, they were the spiritual leaders of the nation. How scary is that? I mean, honestly, Jeremiah had warned over and over and over again all of Judah that they would fall if they were not obedient. But you know what? The folks only wanted to hear good things. They only wanted to hear good news. And so you know what? The priests and the prophets decided to give it to them. Prophets started giving false prophecies in order for the people to agree. The priests, well, they started speaking lies, and the people hid themselves in their sand, hearing what they wanted to hear and doing what they wanted to do. Now, my friends, I have to tell you, there is nothing different in our world today. This is as present day of a warning for us as we could possibly have, because there are plenty of false prophets, there's plenty of false teaching, and there are tempters of every kind in our culture who are whispering in your ear what you want to hear, hoping to entice you into doing what you want to do. You want to know what some of those are like? Because I think we've been hearing them for so long that some of you probably have bought into them too. But they're not biblical. They're false teachings. Here's this first one. We are encouraged to live for ourselves rather than for other people. That is so unbiblical. We are called to be servants. We are not called to live for ourselves. We are told that acquiring more money and more power and more pleasure is the ultimate goal of life. That's a lie from the pit of hell. We are led to believe that all spiritual pursuit will lead us to the same place. You don't have to study too far to find out that there are major differences across religions and that God is related to in a very different way. We're told that we can make up our own rules, that we can have our own gods, that there is no absolute truth, that there's no moral code that's given from God. And we're told that we're better than others. And my friends, the Bible tells us that we are as sinful as the day is long, that all have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us need to throw ourselves on the mercy of Jesus Christ. Our temptation to accept teaching other than what's written in the Bible our temptation to rationalize our behaviors and our actions are rampant because we too want to hear what we want to hear and we want to do what we want to do. We need to pray for godly leaders. We also need to pray that we would be willing to hear the truth and to be obedient to that. You can see in Lamentation 4 what perverted leadership does. It actually caused the entire nation to fall. And if you think we're immune to that today, well, you got another thing coming. Better think differently about that because there are not a lot of differences. And because of the sin, they're living in hopelessness. Living in hopelessness. And there are three particular hopeless things that they talk about, sins, consequences to this disobedience. They're found in verses 17 through 20. The first one is, in verse 17, it says that they have no help. The consequence of living the way in which they've been living is that they have no help. Now, what that means is that Zedekiah, who is the king, was a coward. And instead of doing what God told him to do about the Babylonians, he ran to the Egyptians, who was another military power, to try and make an alliance with them, hoping that they would fight the Babylonians so that Judah would be safe. You know what happened? Egypt didn't show up. Judah was left to hang out to dry. And in verse 17, it says, We wore our eyes out watching and watching for help that never came to us. 
In verses 18 and 19, it says that, well, they also had no way out. Now, here's the deal. The Israelites are living inside the city walls, right? And the enemy is on the outside, and they have not yet broken inside. And yet, the Israelites were still trapped. The Babylonians had built siege ramps up the sides of their gates, and they were shooting arrows up over into the city. Can you imagine walking down the street and having to keep your eyes up, hoping that you're not going to get shot by an arrow? They had no way out. They had no food. They were in danger. They had no way out. They were completely trapped. And those who did try and leave the city were all captured. The third consequence of their sin says that um, we no longer have a king. Verse 20 says, The Lord's anointed, our very life breath, was caught in their traps. We thought that under his shadow that we would live among the nations. Now, folks, we're not used to a king, so maybe it's kind of hard to relate to what that's like. But you have to understand that a king's prime purpose of ruling a nation was to keep the people safe. It was to protect them. And now they had no king. They had no help. They had no way out. And they had no king. This appears to be a pretty sad end for Jerusalem and the Israelites, doesn't it? Watching their family members die of starvation. No way out. You know, if it were me, I'd be digging a hole just to crawl in and just say, let me die. Desolation, despair, so heavy here. But then I have to think about something and wonder. And part of it comes from my own life experience. Part of it comes from lots of stuff that I've read in Scripture. But do you think it's possible that when you get to the end of yourself, when there's nothing left, that that might just be where hope begins, where deliverance starts? You may think I'm naive, but there are lots and lots and lots of stories in the Bible of people who've come to the end of their abilities, the end of their resources, the end of their strength, only to find that in that place, deliverance arrives. Let me give you a couple of examples. Think about David before he became king. What did he do? He was running for his life from Saul. And then he became king, and he became a man after God's own heart, from despair to deliverance. Think about the woman at the well who was an outcast. She had no friends. She had to go to the well in the middle of the afternoon when it was hottest because nobody wanted to be around her until she met Jesus, and he gave her living water. What about the woman who was bleeding for 12 years? Can you imagine? She not only bled for 12 years, but she spent all of her money trying to find help for bleeding. And as an unclean woman, she wasn't allowed to be with people. She was lonely. She was in despair. I imagine she cried out to the Lord, why me? And she was in such a place of despair that she actually was willing to go into public to touch people, to push them aside, to get to Jesus, to touch the hem of his cloak. And he healed her. Martha and Mary devastated at the death of Lazarus until he was raised to life. But think about the disciples and the women who followed. Can you imagine the day that they stood in front of that cross and watched all of their hopes and all of their dreams die on a cross? How do you think they spent those three days between Jesus' death and resurrection, together praying, lamenting, in despair, crying out to God, why? Why? And then he rose again, and deliverance came for all of us. You know, I think that there are times when the Lord will take us to the very end of ourselves in order to find him, to the edge of the abyss, so to speak, shaking all of our confidences so that we will turn our eyes and we will focus on him. During the Ebola crisis back in 2014, Edudations, which is a ministry near and dear to our hearts here at Memorial Park Church, it's a, a, a ministry that builds schools and now clinics in Sierra Leone, West Africa. Well, when the Ebola hit, we closed our schools so as not to spread that nasty disease um, to other people. And we took up the role of purchasing and supplying food to people whose families had been quarantined because of that disease. See, if you had any contact with somebody with Ebola, your entire family was put into a room in your house, and they were quarantined for 21 days. 
Now, the government was supposed to supply food and water to all of these houses, but the sheer volume of people and places that had quarantines, they couldn't keep up with it. And so now people were dying not only of Ebola, but they were dying because they were being quarantined without food or water or any of the supplies they needed. And so Edgenation stepped in and we started to supply these things to people. On one of the food runs that Samuel Cisse, who is our in-country director of, of um, Edge Nations, when he was on one of his runs to supply food to a village where there were many quarantined people, he got a phone call from one of our Sierra Leonean pastors, a gentleman by the name of Pastor James. And Pastor James said, Samuel, John has been quarantined along with all of his family, all 23 of them because one of the ladies in his family had been playing with a child whose mother had just died of Ebola. And here John was, crying out to the Lord, no help, no way out, no supplies, thinking to himself, my family at the end of 21 days is going to be dead, whether it's by Ebola or whether it's by not having food and water, I don't know, but they're all going to be dead. And he cried out in the way in which the Lord offered John help was through Edgenations. Now, let me just give you a little backstory on John. John was one of our original employees, one of our original partners in Edgenations years ago. And because of some very egregious things that he did, he had to be let go. He was fired. And he blamed Samuel for being fired, and he paid a local witch doctor to put a curse on Samuel, hoping to kill him. And now here John is. He's got nothing in a family that he can't protect. And Samuel says to Pastor James, make sure that John and his family get everything that they need. When Pastor James showed up at John's house, John was so overwhelmed with gratitude that his family was going to be saved that he tried to run beyond the barrier of his house, which met him with a guard with a very nice gun, keeping him away from touching anybody. But John yelled out, please forgive me. And would you please ask the church to pray for us? At the end of 21 days, John's family was completely and utterly well. Nobody contracted Ebola. Nobody died because they had everything that they needed. And at the end of that quarantine, Samuel and John were reconciled. Their relationship was restored. And John today is actually a teacher in one of our schools now. But he had to come to the end of himself in order to find a God who would deliver him. That may happen to you. That may be the path that God has for you. He doesn't always work that way, but sometimes he does. Sometimes he's radical, and then he will strip you from everything that you hold dear to, your job, your money, your relationships. No help, no way out, no king, as our text says, so that we will lift our eyes to him and surrender to him. Sometimes this isn't a bad place to be. Sometimes being at the end of yourself, living in hopelessness, is the place in which help comes from. You know, we may not like Lamentations 4. We would maybe perhaps to run from suffering, hide from it, not have to deal with it, not feel it, but we will all face it at some point in our lives. It will come. And so you might just surrender to it, learn how to lament, because you see, my friend, your options is just to be angry. Anger does nothing to help you in this place. But lamenting, lamenting is actually rooted in God's word. And its purpose is to help us to heal, help us to have hope, and to be delivered. And you have God's word on that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that even in the most difficult times of our lives, you have not left us alone. You've actually given us a really wonderful gift in lamenting. Thank you, Lord. As we prepare to take our offering this morning, let us respond with gratitude. Let us hear from you, Lord, these words from Isaiah. You are precious in my sight. Thank you that you are with us in the midst of our hardships and that your mercies are new every day.
And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Lay down your hurt. 
sit at the table, come and taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, and rest that endures. Cause earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So lay down your burden. of complaint can still be prayers of faith. They represent that last refusal to let go of the God who may seem to be absent or worse, uncaring. It is a supreme honesty before a God whom my faith tells me that I can trust. He encourages me to bring everything as an act of worship, my disappointment, my frustrations, and even my hatred. What a wonderful God we have. Hear these words again from Lamentations 3 and take them home with you. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. May feel that way sometimes, might it? But he loves us. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. My friends, depending on how you came in today, you may be waiting for him. If you are, bring your heartache to him. Because remember, there is hope in the midst of hopelessness. Because we have a God who is present and loves us and has given us the art of lamenting. Amen.
thank you, friends, for joining us today in this program, Living Out the Word, from your friends at Memorial Park Church. Whether you tune in on this station or come and join us at our campus at the corner of Duncan and Peebles in the North Hills of Pittsburgh, we are delighted to live out the unchanging word to serve an ever-changing world with you. You can also visit us on the website at www.memorialparkchurch.org. We look forward to seeing you soon, and until then, it's living out the word.